Take charge of your thoughts. Take charge of your life. Psychologist, author, speaker, musician, former professor, and the host of Love and Life, Dr. Karen Anderson Abril. Welcome to Dr. Karen Love and Life. I'm Dr. Karen Anderson Abril. On today's program, we're talking about something that has affected all of us in one way, shape, or form, and especially those of us who are women. We've all dealt with the mean girl phenomenon. Some of us have dealt with it in more intense and extreme ways than others. And it's something I've wanted to address on the program for a while now. And so I'm so excited to bring on the show Katie Hurley, the author of No More Mean Girls. Katie Hurley, LCSW, is a psychotherapist, writer, and speaker based in L.A. Katie earned her bachelor's in psychology and women's studies from Boston College and her MSW from the University of Pennsylvania. Katie has extensive experience treating children and adolescents with learning differences, anxiety, and low self-esteem. Katie's work can be found in the Washington Post, PBS Parents, U.S. News and World Report, and the Huffington Post. Katie is the author of the Happy Kid Handbook, How to Raise Joyful Children in a Stressful World. And, as I mentioned, the book No More Mean Girls, The Secret to Raising Strong, Confident, and Compassionate Girls. Katie, welcome to the program. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to have you on. This is a topic I've wanted to cover for a long time. And I can tell you, as I've been talking to friends about your book and about having you on, all the moms definitely are interested. I think as women, we know that the mean girl phenomenon has been around for a long time. We experienced it probably ourselves. And of course, there was the movie several years ago that was maybe over the top, but maybe not. But the point that you bring up in your book, No More Mean Girls, is that sadly, in this generation, some of this mean girl nastiness is starting even earlier. That's right. When I started out in this field 20 years ago, I really was working on this kind of stuff with older middle school girls and maybe early high school girls, because what we generally find is post age 16, Uh, some of this sort of not totally disappears, but it's easier to manage. They learn how to manage it a little bit better. But in the last 20 years, I have watched it trickle down from, you know, early high school to middle school to sixth grade and and then fourth grade. And now, you know, I get reports, emails, messages, Facebook messages from all over the world of, you know, parents of very young girls, sometimes even in preschool who are experiencing this kind of stuff. And it's really devastating. Well, even your book, the subtitle, A Guide for Parents of Girls Ages 3 to 13. I mean, and I think, again, from our generation, we're thinking, oh, my goodness, even pre-K isn't safe anymore. It's, it's, it's very troubling. Yeah, absolutely. But you provide so many great strategies. And I really want to just from, from the jump, I really want to promote your book because I think it's got, it, so as a psychologist, it's got all the research I needed because I'm a psych nerd. And so I need to see that data, right? And, but it also has all those practical tips that parents need because, you know, they're in the trenches and, and they may be interested in, on some theoretical level about the research, but they want to know how that research applies to helping them help their daughters. That's right. I mean, I work with parents every day and I feel like, you know, I love the research too. And there's that nerdy part of me that just reads study after study and, you know, and it's all interesting to me, but I'm also a mom and I know how busy the days are and how fast time goes by. And sometimes getting bogged down in all of the the statistics and data isn't really useful, but, you know, being able to flip through and find out, okay, how do I deal with this particular issue is useful. So I tried to really set it up in a way that parents could take actionable steps to help their girls right away. You really did. And it was something that I think every chapter, and you even say in the beginning of the book that, hey, if if this is a book that you want to read cover to cover, fine. But if there's a certain chapter you feel your daughter currently is dealing with this particular issue, jump in there. And and, and so it's really user-friendly. So I encourage any moms who are struggling or 
fear that their daughters are struggling or are seeing things. Even I was talking to a friend this morning at my tennis lesson and she said, well, her daughter's 10. And I said, oh my gosh, this is going to be great because your daughter is either in it or just about to get hit with it. But she also is a substitute teacher. So she was thinking, oh, I can't wait to listen to this because I see this as a sub. And, and, and she's covering all age ranges when she's subbing, obviously. So I think it's a great resource. I want to start with a little bit again, because I'm a nerd. I, I want to bring up some of the, the research that you talk about in the book. You cite a Dove survey where the statistics are pretty alarming. 70% of girls don't feel that they're good enough. So they have low self-esteem. And 75% of these girls report negative behavior, be it cutting, bullying, or eating disorders, which is very alarming. But then you say that 91% of girls aged 8 to 12 turn to their mothers as a resource when they feel bad about themselves, and 54% turn to dads. So I think the silver lining here, the hope, is that parents can equip themselves because if they're able to do so and present themselves as, hey, I'm here for you, then the girls will respond. They will come and look for that support from their parents. That's right. And one of the tricky parts about that is that girls in this age range, this 8 to 12 age range, they don't necessarily come home from school and say, Mom, I had a rotten day and these other girls are really mean to me and I'm really confused and I don't know what to do and I had no one to sit with at lunch. What they do is they kind of follow us around. They cling a little bit more. They're maybe grouchier or more irritable than you would expect them to be. Um, and they kind of just start retreating a little bit. So part of it and part of why it's confusing for for parents, I think, is that we really have to be on the lookout for behavioral changes. And those are our cues that something isn't right. And one thing I often talk about with both moms and dads of girls this age is doing something like a mother-daughter or father-daughter journal where you can just write daily notes back and forth to one another. And I even do this with my own daughter just to have that kind of sacred space where we can tell each other funny things. We can tell each other hard things. You know, she can ask a question that maybe she forgot to ask during the day or didn't feel comfortable asking during the day. And kind of just having that outlet that's ongoing, you know, daily throughout the week where they know they can come to us with the hard stuff because it's really, really hard to bring up some of these topics. Yeah. And I wonder, because you're working with these kids in clinical settings as well, how often do they think, well, mom just won't get it because things were so different. She didn't have cell phones and Snapchat and all of the social media, which we know the research is coming out, clearly showing that it's detrimental to girls' psychological welfare and boys too, but girls in a, a slightly different way. But how often do you find that the girls are hesitant because they just don't think that their mothers can understand the landscape that they're dealing with? I see that a lot in my practice because what happens is that parents, we're fixers, right? We feel like we can listen to a problem and come up with three ideas right away. And we base those ideas on our own experience and our past experience and our present experience. But we forget that we need to slow down and really say to ourselves, the landscape has changed for early adolescents and adolescents. And kids are up against much different stressors than they were 30 years ago when we were kids. And we need to really take that into account. And instead of trying to fix everything, we need to be able to just listen and to just not judge and to say, tell me more about that. Or, wow, I, I, I can't even imagine that. Can you explain it a little bit more? Or can you tell me that story again so I can begin to understand it? We have to be better at asking questions and listening to answers because I do find it all the time that girls really feel like, well, I stopped telling mom because she said, don't worry about it it will be better tomorrow. Or, you know, everybody goes through this. Every girl goes through this at some point. It's part of being a girl. And those sort of like vague answers don't really do our girls any good because they're coming to us because they need help. They want to talk things through. They want to know if they're on the right track. They want to know, you know, if there's something specific they could do or they could change. And, you know, when we kind of give them those stock answers and we don't really hear the problem, we don't really listen to the problem they're presenting, well, then we dismiss it and we make them feel like it's sort of all in their head or it's not that important. Everyone knows I love nothing more than a party, which is why I'm so excited to welcome our newest sponsor, Chaotic and Collected Garlands and Party Decor by Jess Downey. Jess creates hip and handmade party supplies. Check them out at Chaotic Collected Inc. 
Jess.com. And if your party has a theme that is a little unconventional, Jess is your girl because she loves creating custom designs for your party. Say a hipster baby shower or a craft beer party or my annual wine and cheese soiree. Chaotic and Collected Inc.com. And my heart goes out to parents in this generation because really they were thrown the curveball of all curveballs with the social media and really starting in 2007. So we're looking at it roughly 10, 11 years ago when the first smartphone rolled out and we then had the access to everyone's life being in the palm of my hand at any given moment. And young girls whose brains are so far from being fully formed and mature are inundated with images and social comparison. And I mean, there's so much research coming out. Uh, the psychologist I'm thinking of is Jean Twingy. I'm sure you're familiar with her research. Is looking, yes, I, Jen. Yep. Yeah. The first longitudinal studies are really are now coming to light and we're seeing that the number of children struggling with depression and anxiety just wasn't the same because we didn't have these little devices in our in our hands to say, oh, my life isn't as great as Susie's. And look, Lisa and, and, and Jenny are at this party and I wasn't invited and it's just always available to them. And so that's just a very powerful, detrimental, frankly, force. And, and like I said, my heart goes out to parents because they had no idea how to handle this. They had no model because their parents didn't have to teach them how to manage this because the technology wasn't there. They didn't. You know, there's a lot of little like micro stressors that happen with technology and girls in this sort of tweeny age range. I mean, for instance, I know groups of 11 year old girls who are in group chats and they'll name it something, you know, like the girls of whatever town, you know, fill in the blank. And there'll be 15 to 20 girls in a group chat, but you can get kicked out of a group chat because you said the wrong thing or something you said was perceived as negative by someone else. You can get added back in if they feel like you deserve to be back in for that day, but it's very precarious. And I have girls, 11, 12 year old girls sitting on my couch week after week, wondering where they went wrong. Why did they get kicked out of the group chat? Why are they no longer part of that group? And that's not even what's happening at school. That's just what's happening before and after school. And, you know, when you're not part of the group chat, well, then you don't get the memo that you're supposed to wear a black t-shirt that day and Adidas or Vans. And so you show up to school and the rest of the girls are dressed similarly and you're the odd girl out because you're not part of that group anymore. And it's very obvious. So there's all these things. There's an interplay between technology and real life for these kids. And we're always scared of social media. And we say, you know, we worry about Snap and we or worry about Instagram. And we worry about, you know, all those different apps, but we forget that the message app can be one of the most dangerous ones in terms of self-esteem because of the in and out and who's controlling the groups and, you know, who's in charge and who gets to say you're in or you're out. It reminds me. So in my day, in my developmental studies, because I'm a developmental psychologist, and so I remember there was this whole secondary egocentrism that we were taught. It was David L. Kine's research about uh, the imaginary audience that teenagers feel, that they really feel, yes. they become self-conscious. And you'll see a very, a child who maybe loved the stage and the limelight before they hit puberty. Now they, they recoil and, into themselves and they believe that everyone is looking at them and judging them, this imaginary audience that is, is observing them at all times. And now I'm thinking, is it so imaginary anymore? <laughs> because it, right. it, it may not be imaginary anymore. <laughs> because really, with the Snap and with the Instagram, there is an audience that, out there at all times that is watching. And, and they are. So it, it's just so different. And uh, so again, that's why I think your book really, it's coming at a perfect time. And it's really bringing very, very needed tools. And one of the tools you bring up very early in the book, which I loved, and I will full disclosure, my favorite therapeutic orientation is cognitive. So yes. I love, yeah, and also family <laughs> systems, but on, on the individual level, I'm just super, super CBT all the way. So when early in your book, you listed some cognitive distortions and encouraged parents to talk about these and explain these to their, their daughters, I thought this is powerful right away. You had me. <laughs> and so can you talk a little bit to the listeners? Cause I mean, here's the thing. We can all learn from some cognitive distortions. It's not just young girls that have distorted thinking. 
Right. And, you know, one thing that we really, that I'm finding that really works with kids, especially in my office, is that, and the reason they like to come to me is because I really break things down for them and I teach them about stuff that they wouldn't otherwise learn about. So they're better to, able to understand their brains and how their brains work and how their thought processes work. And so, you know, in general, kids in that age range are, they tend to engage in black and white thinking. So something is, is either right or wrong, good or bad. Um, you know, that's one of the major ones that they encounter is that they don't see the shades of gray in between. So they can become very fixed in their thinking. And this comes up when you're in or out with those group chats or when there are comments on Instagram or Musical.ly, they're either terrible or they're great. You know, it's, it's one or the other, you know, and then we see kids who distort things by exaggerations. So, you know, a, a, a small stressor that, you know, could be handled that if you could break it down with them and just talk about it could be handled in a certain way suddenly becomes this big life altering thing in their minds and it sort of spins out of control. So I'm always encouraging parents to, instead of using the word, I really have come to despise the word drama because yeah. I think it's just so overused, you know. Girls, at the end of the day, what they're doing is they're trying to communicate something that is upsetting to them, something that is, you know, making their day difficult. And there's a big tendency out there to say, oh, that's just drama. You're being dramatic. This is just girl drama. Get over it. And really what they're experiencing is these cognitive distortions, but also they're trying to communicate. They're trying to say, hey, mom or dad, I'm really struggling here and I don't know how to handle this. And so, yeah, maybe I'm exaggerating it, you know, or yeah, maybe I'm getting a, doing a little black or white thinking, but I'm trying to tell you that my life is really, really hard. And when we take that for our girls and we break it down and we say, let's look at how you're thinking of it. Let's look at this negative thought cycle and where it started. Where did the thought start? What was the feeling that came from the thought? And then what was the behavior that supported the original thought and why does it keep spinning? Let's talk about that and draw it. You know, I always say with girls and boys, but you know, kids, especially in the 10 to 15 age range, don't just talk at them. You know, they tune out at some point. But if you get out a whiteboard or a piece of paper and you draw this stuff out and you help them pinpoint what's happening in their minds and why they're feeling the way they feel, it's really, really powerful. And it's enlightening for them because they learn different ways to react to their thoughts. Well, yeah. I mean, we all like a visual. I mean, you know, I used to teach grad courses and I would teach you know, CBT stuff and cognitive distortions and I would use a whiteboard or a PowerPoint. It's really helpful to have that visual to unpack until you understand that the thoughts and the feelings can be separated. They feel like one big mess. And it's certainly for you, know, right. for 10 year old or eight year old, five year old girls. I mean, they're not going to be able to section that off until they have, well, wait, let's look at this is the feeling, but here's the thought that's supporting the feeling. And it's a feedback loop in both directions. And so where can we intervene and go, you know what? I don't have to think this way. That's where the power is. I can think differently and that's going to help me feel differently. That's something that we all had to learn at some point. And, and certainly kids, it's just one lump of drama, which is the wrong word. But <laughs> you know what I mean? That's right. how they feel. <laughs> and that's what the parents feel. And so, yeah, absolutely. So it's like this big stew of mixed up emotions. And, and you know, it, that's very difficult to weed them out and know where each one came from when it's all swirling around in yeah. a big stew pot for a long time. Exactly. Yeah. Dr. Karen Anderson Abril. I'd love to connect with you on social media. On Instagram, I'm at Dr. Karen, D-R dot K-A-R-I-N. Here I share my thoughts on love and life through original quotes and images. I'd love to have you join the conversation. On Twitter, I'm at Dr. Karen Anderson. You can find me live tweeting my favorite shows, This Is Us, Will and & Grace, and My Guilty Pleasure. All shows Bachelor Nation. On Facebook, I'm at Dr. Karen Anderson Abril. There you can read my blog, see where I'm speaking, and find links to others' podcasts when I'm a guest on their show. I want to talk a little bit too about a child development study that you bring up in in the book. And I used to teach grad courses uh, at, at a university where I was teaching two tracks. One was the community mental health. The other track was the school counseling health. So, so some of the stuff you talked about in school-based interventions was really interesting to me and your work within schools. And so this child development study really looked at the effectiveness of of social emotional learning. Now, SEL is what they call it in the literature. And it's something that I think 
there's always this tension in school districts because they are teaching the test and they've got their curriculum that has to, and all the academics and the reading and the math, and that's all important. And no one's trying to say it's not. But we also know that these kids are in this social world for a lot of hours every day. And if they don't have tools to navigate their way, I mean, come on, it's going to affect their academics. And so this study, I just want to bring it up because it really highlighted the, the reality of this. It said the kids who went through a social emotional learning curriculum, they increased their standardized test scores by 11 percentile points. And so for the, any who want to argue that, hey, school should be academics and let the social development happen at home and in Sunday school, hey, that should be happening as well. But to think that the school with the number of hours that kids spend in the school and where they're really working out their social relationships in schools shouldn't address social emotional learning to some degree, that seems really a poor way of looking at things. And I just want to give some tangibles for anyone who's going, what's social emotional learning? So in addition to the increased standardized test scores, they also had improved social skills. The kids who had experienced this training had less emotional distress, better attitudes, fewer incidents of bullying, and more frequent positive or pro-social behaviors. So that's taking the initiative to be helpful to other kids, cooperating with others. And then, Katie, just so listeners understand, what kinds of skill sets are we trying to develop with what we call social-emotional learning? Well, I mean, what you and I both know and what this research supports is that when kids can manage, they can self-regulate their own emotions and they can identify, verbalize what they're feeling, you know, identify what's triggering that feeling, then they get those feelings out and they learn how to manage and they learn how to cope and then they're better able to learn, which is why those percentage points go up when schools are using these programs. But so really what we're talking about is a big umbrella of dealing with different social skills that kids might not otherwise be learning or, you know, they're learning it in isolation at home or in Sunday school or in temple or wherever. And it's not transitioning into the school because what we know is when they're at school for six plus hours a day, that's sort of their micro classroom for social skills as well, because they're dealing with interacting with other kids, with all the feelings in the room, with teachers and teachers aides and, you know, different kinds of teachers when they go out for art and music and PE and whatever else. So we're talking about uh, teaching them how to gauge their own emotions, how to label and process their own emotions, how to work out conflict with their peers, how to assert themselves, how to ask for help. There's a surprising amount of kids out there who just don't know how to ask for help when they're struggling. And so they kind of suffer silently or they, quote, act out and, you know, don't follow the rules. And that's how they cope with it maladaptively. So, you know, all these sorts of things are skills that kids can learn. And the classroom is actually a wonderful place to practice those skills because they're with 20 something other children who can help them work through this stuff. And there's all kinds of great programs. I mean, Yale developed the ruler program and schools are using the ruler program. Kids show up to circle time and instead of doing, you know, the date and the weather, they've got, they've each got their own feelings thermometer and they start the day by checking in with everybody in circle time about how they're feeling, where they are on that thermometer and what's happening. And they sort of get a chance to offer help or support to other kids in the circle. The teacher gets a chance to gauge what the emotions of the room are. And that's how they start the day. They start and end the day that way. And they learn how to help each other out when they're going through that. Mind Up is, you know, a similar program that's based more in mindfulness, but they also have emotions check-ins. They have all sorts of brain break activities because we know that sitting and attending to learning for too long, for too long of a period of time is just you hit a point of no return and the kids stop learning at some point. And so they factor in all sorts of information on the brain and kids can learn about their brains and they can learn their triggers and they can learn how they feel when they're starting to lose attention or when they're frustrated or when they're anxious. Um, so there's all these wonderful programs out there. I was just reading about a school in Texas this morning that decided to really overhaul their program because they were having truancy. They were having a lot of suspensions. Uh, grades were not looking good. Test scores were low. And a new principal came in and said, we need to do something differently. Let's work on the social emotional piece of this and see if it helps. And the teachers were in, they all bought into it. They all worked on it together. And don't you know, their scores are going up. Truancy is down. Bullying is down. Fewer suspensions. So when these programs are implemented well, when all of the teachers buy into it and implement it as it's to be, you know, used, they really are effective. And everyone wins. Kids are happier. 
They want to be there. Like you said, less truancy. The principals are happy because their scores are going up. So everyone wins. <laughs> so it, it, it's really, it's yeah. powerful stuff. And here again, that's where the research, we do need the data to say, yep, mm-hmm, it's worth it. And that's important. You know, you mentioned bullying a little bit. I do want to speak to that just a bit because that's such a hot topic. And of course, bullying takes many different forms nowadays because of, again, technology. And one of the things that I remember from my uh, coursework was the notion, you talk about it too, you talk about upstanders and supporters. And can you explain a little bit about that? Because it's, it's reminiscent of some of the early research on bullying, which again, I think even research on bullying from 10 years ago probably needs a refresh because of just the, the many ways that one can be bullied now, James. <laughs> That's right. I mean, it's, it has, it's, it, bullying has really changed faces over the years. And not that we don't still see some physical bullying, because certainly we do, but we see more, what we see more of is relational aggression, which can take the form of cyberbullying, which can happen face to face where kids are really trying to damage the reputation of other kids or humiliate other kids in front of their peers and that kind of stuff, which is every bit as damaging as the physical bullying that used to be sort of the bigger thing that was happening. So one thing that we're really encouraging kids to do right now is to act as upstanders. And for years, all kids heard was stand up to the bully, make a joke, walk away. And those things don't work. What we know is that those things are exceptionally difficult to do at pretty much any age. I mean, even an adult would say that it's really hard to make a joke when someone is kind of tearing you apart emotionally, or it's really hard to just stand up to someone who's making you feel very, very small. But what we find does work is when we instill empathy in kids and we promote and teach empathy at home, in the classroom, wherever they go. And we encourage kids to be upstanders by helping a peer in need. So if you teach your child to sort of scan the room and look for the person who needs the most help, it's not that that child has to go over and stand up to the bully because we know that that's hard and we can't expect other kids to be able to do that. What they can do is put an arm around the person who is being bullied or being victimized and say, hey, I'm Katie, let's go play over here. Let's go do something different. You know, let's get out of here. So we can teach kids to help each other get out of difficult situations just by showing up and being a friend. And that's what it means to be an upstander. This concludes part one. Join us for part two of Dr. Karen's conversation with Katie Hurley as they continue discussing mean girl culture and other realities of child development today. They tackle important concerns, including the profound effects of sleep deprivation on kids, hyper competitive academic and sports culture and the current debate surrounding praise. You can find Katie on Facebook at Katie Hurley LCSW. Katie is K-A-T-I-E, Hurley, H-U-R-L-E-Y, L-C-S-W. On Instagram and Twitter, Katie's at Katie F. Hurley. So the love and life hack for this week is girls can be mean, but we can intervene. And there are practical and powerful strategies that we can teach young ladies to help them become more compassionate with one another and help them support each other and together take a stand against the mean girl phenomenon. Thanks so much for joining me today. And until next time, make it a great week. Dr. Karen, Love and Life is produced by Chip Gregory, Senior Producer Michelle Musso, and Host and Executive Producer Dr. Karen Anderson-Abril. 